All right, guys, we are going to go ahead and try to start with this new form of teaching, which is going to be me just talking to you, which I guess is how I normally teach, but it's weird because I'm having to look at myself right now as I do this, which is basically my nightmare. Um, so how this is going to work is basically I'm going to walk through all the slides very, very briefly. Um, it should not take very long. And then in addition to that, uh, I'm going to be adding some information in there. At the very end of this, I do have uh, an explanation of how to do the classwork. Uh, and I go through one of the three parts of the classwork today with you. So even if you don't want to listen to me talk about the PowerPoint that you've already written down, which you should listen to because I do add additional information that helps with the classwork, you will want to stick around for the end of this video to see how I actually do the classwork. All right, so the notes that you should be on are the interwar politics notes. I figured out a way to take my face off the screen, which thank God, because that was just horrible. Um, so we're going to first start with the interwar politics. And the biggest thing I need to make sure that you guys understand is what fascism is. Fascism is an intense form of nationalism, uh, and it's where they want people to conform to the state. They don't want you to be your own individual person. They want the state to tell you who to be. Uh, Italy, Germany, and Japan all were fascists during this time. One of the confusing elements is that the USSR was communist, which is not fascism. Uh, it's something kind of different, and in fact, Italians and Germans hated communism. Uh, so communism basically is where everyone is the same. Fascism is this idea that since you are from a certain country, you are super, super special. Uh, and that's where some of that disagreement comes into. Uh, Italy is going to be led by a guy named uh, Mussolini. Hitler is leading Germany. And then Japan is led by an emperor named Hirohito. Uh, the USSR is going to briefly be led by a guy named Vladimir Lenin. And then he died and Stalin is going to take over. Now, this starts something kind of interesting because the USSR and Germany are actually going to make an agreement to not attack one another at the start of this war. Germany is going to turn its back on that agreement later on. Um, and that's basically the big players right now for interwar politics. There are two major things that went on that actually started World War II. And when you think about World War II, the easiest way to think about World War II is that there were two different wars going on simultaneously, but they were kind of connected to one another. So the first one is going on in Europe. That's probably the one that you've heard about the most. The one in Europe is going to be where Hitler is going to begin to basically take over parts of Europe. Italy is going to take over parts of North Africa. Uh, and the reason for why this really happened was because of fallout from World War I. The Treaty of Versailles that was signed in World War I was super unfair to Germany. Uh, it basically made them pay for the entire war. We talked about that. It was called the War Guilt Clause. And Germany couldn't pay it back. So they go into massive poverty. Uh, and they turn to a guy they don't fully understand, and that's going to be Hitler. Hitler basically gets to his rise by explaining this fascist idea that Germans are special, and we are going to make ourselves special again. Now, the British and the French, they couldn't even follow the entire parts of the Treaty of Versailles because it was so difficult to follow. It's kind of like there's sometimes teachers who make rules in the classroom, and then the teacher realizes how much work it's going to take to keep that rule in place. And so slowly they begin to do this thing called appeasement, which is basically where they let students slide on the rules. Um, so Germany is going to begin to slowly break parts of the Treaty of Versailles and Great Britain and France don't do anything to stop it because they still remember World War I and they don't want another war. Well, obviously that's not going to work, but at the beginning they just allow for Germany to kind of slowly take pieces back of their former empire. Uh, Japan, meanwhile, is going to really, really need natural resources and they are going to invade China. China actually was going through a civil war at this time, so Japan is able to get a lot of China, and then those two eventually start a war with each other, China and Japan. Japan, Germany, and Italy are all going to form this power, or this um, alliance, called the Axis Powers. So the war eventually breaks out over Poland and Europe. Technically, the war had already started in Asia, but a lot of times we say that the war starts in 1939 with Germany invading Poland. 
The United States, or uh, Great Britain and France had told Germany, do not invade Poland. If you invade Poland, we are super serious this time. We will definitely make sure to go to war with you. Germany invades Poland, and that starts war. Now, the war starts in 1939, but for a while, Germany's still just invading Poland, and they're not coming towards the French. In 1940, they're going to come at the French with everything they have. Germany was practicing this thing called Blitzkrieg, uh, which is basically this type of fighting where you just throw everything as fast as you can at certain parts of your enemy. Um, they would make their soldiers move for 72 hours at a time uh, without sleep. And actually one of the ways that they were able to get them to do this was because a lot of their soldiers were taking basically an, uh, crystal meth. Um, they were taking an amphetamine that was causing them to not have to sleep. And this is also explaining some of the horrible things that these German soldiers did because they were basically cracked out at this time, just moving at a massive speed through France. Now, France is not on crystal meth. And if you've ever seen anyone on crystal meth, basically France responded the same way where it's like, what? what is wrong with this person? Why are they constantly coming at me without any type of regard for their own humanity? And so France is quickly overrun in six weeks, actually. And this is a big deal because like when all this war stuff was starting, the British were actually looking at the French as kind of the people that were going to be able to stop Germany. Uh, Churchill, who was the prime minister for Great Britain at the time, actually said, thank God for the French army. Well, the French army lasted six weeks. So the British, they have no idea what to do with this crackhead. So because of that, they are just going to flee back to their own island. And so in 1940, we had this set up situation of where France has been taken over by Germany. The British are on their own island, just scared of this crackhead. And Germany seems completely composed to be able to take over whatever it wants of Europe and maybe even keep it. And that could have happened except for Germany is going to make a big mistake in the end of 1940, which is going to be they're going to go back on their deal with the Soviet Union and they're going to invade Russia. They're going to use this blitzkrieg idea to invade Russia as well. And they're actually going to get super far into Russia. Um, they're only going to be about 60 miles outside of Moscow when winter came. And there is one big historical thing that you need to know. You never invade Russia in the winter because it gets really cold and those guys are used to it and you're not. Um, this is going to be a massive flaw to Hitler's plan, but we'll talk more about that later on. Okay, so if you look, there were a couple of charts that I put on the PowerPoint. The biggest thing that I wanted you to see from those charts is uh, the difference between military deaths and total death. Now, it doesn't really matter. Like, you don't need to know any of the numbers or anything like that. The biggest thing I wanted you to be able to see is, one, World War II is way bigger than World War I in terms of total death. Two, the Soviets are going to lose a massive amount of people, way more people than anybody else. Uh, and, and we'll talk more about why that is later on down the road. But the biggest thing to remember with that is Soviet loss of life is huge because that's going to play a big part at the end of the war. And then three, you should see that the number of civilians that died is also really big. And that's because World War II is a total war, meaning that both military and civilian targets are targeted. This is all great and fun talking about World War II, but this is American history. So what is America doing at this time? Well, we got to go back and talk about what the United States has been doing in terms of foreign policy since World War I, something we haven't talked about that much. So after World War I, the United States wants nothing to do with the rest of the world. They want to be left alone. They want to be isolationist. Now, why is that? There's a couple of reasons why. Number one, they hate the Treaty of Versailles, uh, and they do not want to join it, and they don't want to pay for the League of Nations. Now, this is the first slide, really, where there's a couple things that maybe you need to know, and it's honestly going to help you with your classwork. So you may want to write down some of this additional stuff. The United States viewed Europe very old-fashioned at this point. Um, they thought of them trying to still establish these big colonial empires, and the United States actually used to be a part of one of those colonial empires. And the United States was not really into imperialism the same way that Europe was, and so they saw them as kind of backwards and having all these old ideas out of touch. 
The second, why they hated the Treaty of Versailles, already with the League of Nations we've talked about. Number two, there were a lot of Germans living in the United States during this time. And again, the Treaty of Versailles was super unfair to Germans, uh, or Germany, and Germans felt a certain type of way about that. So because of that, they are not going to support it. Um, you're also going to have this really, really weird situation that takes place where Republicans are going to gain, gain control of the Senate. Woodrow Wilson was a Democrat. He was the one who wanted the Treaty of Versailles to pass. And the Republicans actually thought that um, really it wasn't a, a very good idea. Um, now, if you guys remember, Wilson tried very, very hard. He went on a train tour all around the, the United States to try to get this to pass. And he actually sh had a stroke and a heart attack. Um, no, just a stroke. Sorry, confusing him and Warren Harding. Presidents were really unhealthy during this time, I guess. Um, so he has a stroke and he loses severe motor capability, meaning he can't talk very much anymore. In fact, by the end of his presidency, we don't really know how much he was actually doing. Uh, and there's this really heartbreaking scene where actually he went on the Senate floor to try to appeal to the senators to pass this thing, and he couldn't get the words out because his motor functions were down. Um, and so because of that, it, it doesn't pass. Uh, he cannot convince Republicans to pass it. Uh, and then the last ones are, are on the slides, which is that you know nativism is going to come in a big way because of communism. So we, we don't want communism into the country. We feel like that's a good way to stay isolationist. And then the Great Depression is also happening, which is just where this primal thing takes place of where you got to take care of yourselves. And, you know, that's a big part of the United States, I guess, still to this day. You see people on, uh, like, hoarding supplies right now for a coronavirus, just buying all the toilet paper and all the hand sanitizer. And that's kind of how the United States felt with the Great Depression, which was we just need to take care of ourselves. Now, this isn't to say the United States didn't do anything on the international front. The stuff that they did on the international front, though, was more about trying to make themselves more isolated. Uh, so there are two big things you want to know. First is uh, the Washington Naval Conference. And this was going to be where the United States actually reduced the amount of weapons worldwide. So they actually tried to lower the probability of war by just trying to reduce the weapons. So because of that, they did sign those treaties. Um, you also have the Smoot-Hawley Act. Uh, this is going to reduce international trade. Herbert Hoover created this, my, my dear friend Herbert. And um, it actually was a horrible idea. Uh, Herbert made a big mistake with this one. It made the Great Depression much worse. But basically, he tried to stop international trade into the United States uh, to try to boost our own economy. It didn't work. And then the final way that you can kind of see this is we didn't join World War II until Pearl Harbor, but that that's going to be a little more complicated than that. So in talking about that, um, the United States was hardcore neutral um, at the beginning. We signed these things called the Neutrality Acts, which is where we weren't giving money, or giving loans, giving weapons to any warring country. Uh, that slowly starts to change in 1937. In 1937, we're going to pass this act called the Cash and Carry Act, which is where we would sell countries' goods, um, but they had to come pick them up and they had to pay cash. Well, there's only two countries that could really do that, France and Great Britain, based off geography. Um, and we knew that. And that was kind of the two countries that we wanted to help with that. So this is kind of where we're still neutral because we're offering this out to everybody, but really only France and Germany or Great Britain can, can take that. Um, next we're not going to be neutral the next step. And that's in 1940, we do this thing called the Lend-Lease Act. And that's where the United States gives weapons to certain countries, which is again, France and the UK. Um, and they just have to give them back at the end of the war. Um, we're not offering that out to anyone else. Uh, FDR gives this big speech in 1940 called the Arsenal for Democracy, um, which is not Germany, not Italy, not even the USSR. It's important to note the USSR at this point is out of World War II. They are not involved in World War II. And even when they join in World War II, uh, we do start to give them stuff. Um, so it just really shows that we're starting to side more with these allied powers than with this Axis powers. Okay, so the last thing that we need to talk about is the US and Japan. 
So Japan had been invading China. They needed China for natural resources. And the United States didn't like that. They wanted China to be able to trade with whoever they wanted. And um, Japan was also doing some really messed up things to the Chinese. I don't have a lot of time to talk about it right now, but if you go look up the Rape of Nanking or something like that, like you'll, you'll see just some of the atrocities that the Japanese were doing. And the United States doesn't want to be supporting that. And then Japan starts to talk about taking over the Philippines. The Philippines were actually a U.S. territory. And so because of that, we are going to do an embargo. We're not going to give them any more oil or airplane parts um, and stuff to, they would use to make war. And Japan gets really mad at us about this. And we knew Japan was mad, but we thought that we were actually in the process of creating some type of peace agreement with them. And um, so while we're kind of understanding that Japan is tense at us, we did not expect necessarily an attack from them. Japan decides that they are going to attack uh, Pearl Harbor, which is in Hawaii. And the reason why they're going to do this is this is where we kept our Pacific fleet. So they're going to attack Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. It was a surprise attack. Uh, and they thought they could hit us in a way to where basically we would not be able to respond back. Um, but we actually were a little bit lucky. Some of our biggest ships were away from the harbor that day. Still, this attack was devastating. Uh, 12 ships were destroyed. 3,000 people died. Uh, and this is going to ultimately be the cause for us joining World War II. All right, the last thing I wanted you to look at was uh, those two documents that are at the bottom of the PowerPoint. And there was one from Harry Truman, uh, who was a senator at the time, but he's going to become really important. He's going to become president of the United States. And he says this quote, if we see that Germany is winning, we ought to help Russia. And if we see Russia is winning, we ought to help Germany. And that way, let them kill as many as possible. And that's truly how Truman felt. Truman really, really hated Russia. And that's okay to hate Russia at this point because Stalin was a pretty bad guy, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. But then if you look down at the Lend-Lease Act, you'll see that we gave over $11 billion to Russia. So why did we help the Soviet Union or Russia, but at the same time, Truman's saying this stuff that basically comparing them Russia to Germany. Well, when Germany invades Russia, uh, we decided to align ourselves with Russia. And there was a couple of reasons why we did this. But the biggest reason is this phrase, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, which is basically if we have a common enemy, even if I'm not friends with you, I can still use you to defeat my enemy. And we've thought that Germany was a more legitimate threat than the Soviet Union. And so because of that, we're going to align with the Soviet Union and help them get more supplies to attack Germans. And the Soviet Union definitely did attack Germany. Um, they were actually the ones who were on the doorstep of Hitler when Hitler commits suicide. Um, and then after this, we were basically going to not have a relationship with the Soviet Union. And that's probably one of the most confusing things about World War II is we're going to go from being friends with the Soviet Union to almost immediately going to this Cold War with them. And that's the reason why is once Germany is removed, we don't have to do our fake friendship with Russia anymore. I want to explain really quickly the classwork. So for your classwork, you need to do an answer site explained for three different questions. I'm actually going to do an answer site explained for letter A, but let me just explain the three questions to make sure you understand them. First one is describe one development that contributed to isolationist sentiment in the United States from 1919 to 1940. So what I want you to do with this question is explain to me why did the United States become isolationist during this time period? Number two, I want you to explain an effect of the isolationist sentiment that the United States had from 1919 to 1940. So because the United States is isolationist, what are other things that they did or contributed to? What are the actions that they took during this time period that reflected this isolationist sentiment? And then number three, I want you to explain one similarity between the United States foreign policy in the 1790s and during this time period, 1919 to 1940. What is something that you see that's similar? I'm gonna link the PowerPoint on my website 
uh, to the 1790s that would help you answer this, but I'm going to give you a big hint. It has to do with what the French and the British were doing during this time and how the United States responded. All right, so let me walk through A with you really quickly. So we need to describe one development that contributed to isolationist sentiment in the United States from 1919 to 1940 using the ACE model, which means we just need to have an answer, we need to have an example, and we need to be able to explain our example. So my answer for the contribution to isolationist sentiment would be that the United States was not in support of ending the world, or the United States didn't support how World War I ended and how it was handled by European leadership. So I'm saying that that is an example of something that contributed to isolationist sentiment for the United States. They didn't like how World War I ended, um, and that is leading them to be isolationist. My site is simply that we didn't sign this Treaty of Versailles. Um, and that is a, a site or an example of how we showed that we were not in support of how World War I ended. And then my explain is by us not joining the League of Nations and signing the Treaty of Versailles, it showed that we didn't approve how it ended. So because we didn't join this League of Nations, that's showing that we did not support how World War I ended. And ultimately, that was a huge thing that led us into isolation of sentiment. So now what you're going to do is you're going to give me an effect. So what's something that took place from 1919 to 1940 that you could say is an effect from the United States being isolationist during this time? And then again, you're going to do the similarity between the United States foreign policy of the 1790s to the 1919 to 1940 time range. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be happy to help you.